Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. It's the 18th of December. It's right, it's a Sunday morning. I'm sitting in the kennel. And don't click, do, do not click. Do not hit fast forward until you hear what I have to tell you, okay? I had Glenn Blackwood come over here to record this just about a week ago. With this, this is something that got put together over a couple months of work, and it's a bottle of Whistle Pig single barrel. If you know anything about whiskey, single barrel means there's only one like it. It's 11-year-old straight rye whiskey. There's no limit on the bottles. You can go to Greens Farms Spirits, all plural, greensfarmsspirits.com, and then doing the search bar, search for rough grouse, okay? And you'll get a chance, if there's any left, I'm sure you can get this to you before Christmas Day. And if you dilly and dally, you might get it before New Year's. But if you really dilly dally, it's not going to be available. That's how fast this stuff goes. Anyway, Glenn and myself and uh, a, a bunch of, a, a cast of characters from the Rough Grouse Society, we got on together on a Zoom room and, and they, had sent us, they had sent us a whole bunch of samples, unmarked. We had to all taste test them from different locations. And everybody unanimously, of course, you know, my opinion was probably low on the choice scale, but true connoisseurs of of especially whistle pig said that this is the one we want this is the barrel we bottled it we labeled it and it's available to anybody who's a rough grouse society a member or a listener of this podcast i i gave my patrons a first shot at it to make sure they could get it there's still some bottles left and part of the proceeds of this bottle go directly to the rough grouse society for habitat and that's that's a Christmas gift. You can get yourself the bottle of whistle pig, and you're doing something, you know, you're doing something for conservation. So I need you to go to Greens Farms Spirits. That's all plural. Greens Farms Spirits.com. And you can and go into your search bar and search, just type in roughed grouse. That's all you have to do, roughed grouse, and it'll pop up a link. And you can get yourself a bottle of this very special 11-year-old 113.8 proof. <laughs> Hot shit there. Um, there's no limit on bottles. The only limit's going to be if you didn't get on, the, if you didn't get on the, the website quick enough to get what's left. It's one, bo- one barrel that they bottled. It's, it's a single barrel special. And uh, so there. That's what you can do for this Christmas and this New Year. Do something for yourself. Do something for your family who loves a good, a really good, really good bottle of, of you know, it's rye whiskey. I mean, it's, it's, I, I even got it down. Now, of course, I had a little chaser of beer with me. I'm not a whiskey drinker. Everybody knows that. But this stuff is awesome. I want you to go to greensfarmsspirits.com and then type in rough groused. Rough Grouse. That's real simple. And there you go. You might have got a letter from Rough Grouse about this already. You might be a patron of mine who already got this notification. This is just for all the other listeners who really want a special bottle of something and want to do a little something for Habitat. Greenfarmsspirits.com. Now, we always go through, I'm just going to zing through them because I'm going to put out another episode on Tuesday. My Patreon patrons, which we will have one more Zoom room here. Probably before the new year. Uh, no, I mean before the new year. Probably in between Christmas and new year. Pike Gear, my title sponsor. Onyx Maps, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Gunner Kennels, and Food Crates. Garmin, W Hunting Supply, Deck Drawer Systems, Weatherby Shotguns, Purina Pro Plan, Canine Athlete, and the Upland Institute. All those things are all things you can get. But I'm telling you to hold off on all my sponsors 
until you go to greensfarmsspirits.com. Click on Rough Grouse. Look for that bottle. You'll love it. It's a beautiful bottle. It's a beautiful label. They got an extra, they got two additional labels on the bottle to denote it's for Rough Grouse Society. You're going to love it. You're going to love this episode. And just wait till you hear Glenn tell the story about him wanting to get a new chair. Okay? Worth the price of admission. Just listen to this episode for Glenn's story about now he's got two dogs and he tells his wife he wants one of them big chairs in a house so they can both sit on his lap. Yeah, you're going to love this. Uh, yeah, it's just me and Glenn talking about rough grouse, our hunting season, our dogs, some funny stories. And uh, I'll talk to you again on Tuesday with another episode. That's it. Simple. That was it. I mean, what am I at? Five minutes and it was all basically for, uh, you know, Rough Grouse Society. So do it. And even if you don't hunt rough grouse, I know you drink. Talk to you soon. Hey, we got an SD card in there, Glenn. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I'm sitting in the kennel with Glenn Blackwood. If you don't know that name, then you haven't listened to enough podcasts of mine. I formerly named him the Upland Librarian many years ago. And you've been pulled onto a few podcasts just for your librarian skills, haven't you? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where... Uh, um, it's fun to talk about old books and sporting literature and, uh, you know, uh, able to pass on uh, some views that uh, I've developed over the years. Yeah, did you have the, I can't remember, did you have the book love? Bef- you had the book love. You got those books when you were a kid, right, from your mom and dad, like before you were even shotgun swinging. Uh, well, right yeah. Right about the same time. I, I mean, uh, uh, yes, uh, I've always been a reader. Um you know, and it, it started, uh, you know, just going to the library uh, with my mother. We those are those buildings that we had when we grew y- yeah, up? Yeah, exactly. That were, that were near our school and in our schools? Is that what and, we're talking uh, about? And then, uh, you know, my parents and grandparents started buying, you know, sporting books, uh, fly fishing and wing shooting books uh, for Christmases and birthdays. And so that you, exposed me to, you know. You're uh, easy kid to buy for. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Get him another book. Uh, get him another book. Uh, you know, he'll sit in the corner and shut up, and we don't have to. You know, we don't have to do it. It's anything. before videos. You know, it's uh, so. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how that came, and it's just morphed into, um, I guess, having a, a little baseline knowledge or or opinions. Probably more yeah. opinions than baseline. So you knowledge. did have the books before you had the dogs. Oh, um, before yes. your dogs. Yeah. Well, anyway, so I should I should finish. Glenn is the director of regional development for the Rough Grouse Society for the Lower Peninsula, Eastern UP of Michigan and Indiana, which I guess we should maybe put a black armband on for Indiana right now. Is that his Well, or, or uh, is we're it, certainly is uh, for doing some things down there and, and policy-driven trying to, to get uh, that. Uh, Would that be in the Hoosier, down in the Hoosier? Yeah, yeah. get that uh, moving forward. Um, so also do some things in Illinois and the UP and uh, uh, in around, so. You basically go around muscling people, Glenn. Let's be honest now. Oh, no. You, you know I don't muscle anybody. It's just charm. <laughs> Where's your no. chew? You don't have your chew in today. Uh, no, I wanted to. Did you to, quit? Uh, n- no, uh, uh, you know, trying to cut back. <laughs> Usually I was have to give you a spit cup when no, you get over not here. Not today. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just wanted to get Glenn in here. We kind of have a, a, a special thing we want to talk about, but I want to kind of get into the, the grouse news first. Um, first, how was your season? Um, for Michigan, you're a Mich- you're kind of a dyed in the wool Michigan grouse guy. You don't go to Maine and I I, you I have, was fortunate I mean. to I mean with the national hunt, uh, you know, we did uh, we spent some time in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota yeah. Um and did hunt the the UP as well as uh, the northern lower uh, yeah. this year. Um I started out uh, having a, a pretty strong season uh, mm-hmm. through uh, all in all. Um uh, and then uh, unfortunately uh, I lost the third week of October. Uh, my mother passed away. Uh, some of your readers may have may have heard that. Uh, I'm not trying to wear that on my sleeve. Um, she died. Things uh, do get in the way of grouse season. Uh, she died very peacefully, uh, with no pain. Uh, it was a blessing. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, uh, I I lost uh, kind of that that last week that, of October. That great week. Uh, usually the great week. Yeah. yeah. And, but you know in. Uh, in the big scheme, in, of in the big scheme, scheme <laughs> of things, uh, you know, it uh, 
it, it really uh, allowed me to 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 focus on you know faith, family, and friendships. Um, those the three F's, if you will. Um, but what was was really kind of fun was through that time. Um, and my boyhood best friend, Chris from Connecticut came back and, you know, he had the Bible my, uh, my mother gave him, uh, when he was nine years old in, in Sunday school. Uh, <laughs> was your mom a Sunday school teacher? Oh, my mother was, yes. Of course, uh, of course. Wasn't you everybody's know, mom thrown you know, up to that duty one time or another? My mother was a, a dichotomy of things, uh, but, uh, she was a very, she was a strong old gal, uh, in a, in a lot of ways, yeah. uh, but uh, coming back to what we're talking about today, it was uh, the through that time, it, and again, surrounded by family from both coasts and friends and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, it, kind of the, the solitary time uh, in the morning and evening when uh, I was with dogs, mm-hmm. um, stretching dogs' legs that, uh, you know, and, and again, I grew up in Ohio, um, and she was buried in, in kind of the rural agricultural part of Ohio, but, you know, I was able to, to let dogs romp a little bit in some, some grass fields that, uh, I walked when uh, you were, as a kid when you were and, a kid. and That's just cool. Cause you know, but it was those, those morning romps, if you will, yeah. um, and evening romps that, you know, had that circle back and, yeah, and I don't provided put words in your mouth, solace. but it's almost as good as a hunt, right? Ah, right. I mean, in a different, it's a different well, kind of hunt. It's like a hunt for memories. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it. It all comes back, uh, comes back to the dogs, and uh, you know, you you talk about uh, about that. Um, you know, if you ask me about, you know, how my season was. Probably the the three most memorable things I have from the season is uh, the black dog, uh, Bosco, made a, a, and I'm bragging now, um, you never should brag about your dogs, but made a a tremendous retrieve on a a grouse uh, that uh, my friend C.D. Clark, the sporting artist, pummeled. Thought the bird was stone dead. Thought. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we retrieved the bird a good 35, 40 yards away uh, that the black dog made that retrieve. So that wasn't a bird I was involved in. Right. Um, it was just uh, a really strong retrieve. And then. Uh, Which, in all uh, honesty, grouse, there's not a lot of great retrieves in grouse. They're usually on the ground. But, uh, you know. Anyway, and again, I, we all thought this bird was was smoked. <laughs> yes, pillowcased, if you will. Yeah. But uh, and then the little white dog Whisk, and bragging again, um, had a really, really nice flush on a a pair of woodcock mm-hmm. that were fifteen yards away in a classic aspen stand with a little creek boggy that goes down through the center of it and uh, I was so enamored with the dog work that and watching the dog uh, because I'm trying to steady him up a little bit that uh, I didn't even mount my gun I mean the birds went up and I (laughs) looked at the dog and the dog was kind of not completely hopped but still standing Mm -hmm. Um, and he has his eyes were kind of Canted towards me and watching these birds fly, uh, so that was uh, probably the second most. And you know, it was uh, what it was all about. And then uh, the third uh, most memorable, uh, I guess, looking at was again uh, we hunted. Uh, it was a snowy day uh, up towards you know north of 612 uh, grayling mm-hmm. levels area uh, back in uh, right before deer gun season. Um, and we had a tough day. Uh, birds were in the pines and didn't do anything. But uh, at the end of the day, we're walking back to the truck on this kind of two track. And I'm uh, just letting the 
little guy stretches legs and uh this is your young one yeah the young one yeah and uh i don't know we're 25 20 25 yards from the truck and you know it break the gun open and throw it over my shoulder and uh sure enough he found a a grouse grouse right on the road that gave us this good crossing look um and uh, you know he just pops up like uh Hey, Dad, that's what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? Uh, why didn't you shoot? Uh, so, you know, again, it's, uh, it's, it's. But there's always those every season. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, there's all kinds of grouse encounters, but there's just certain bird encounters that you don't forget. You know, and, uh, and it comes back to, you know, habitat. It comes back to being where birds are. It's that baseline biological understanding of, you know, what cover you want to be in at the end of the day when it's cold, where there could be some berries yeah. or soft acorn mass, whatever. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. I guess uh, I did everything but pay attention. So, uh, well, you hey, know. That's three good. I got three good memories without a bird being shot in them this year, too. So if you don't know it, if you don't remember, Glenn's also addicted to Cocker Spaniels, right? Uh, apparently. I'm enamored by the little guys. Okay, I'd call it, I'm calling it addicted. I'm not enamored yet, but <laughs> I am addicted to them. And we had a little chat before, before we hit the record button, and uh, I had some similar things that happened to me in South Dakota. And for some reason, I don't know why this does this, but you, have, you, you get the pup, you already got a picture in your mind how it's going to be someday, right? Someday I'm going to shoot a bird, and someday I, it's going to... You think about all that when you have a new dog. I want... And then when it happens, like I had three encounters with no gun. It was just like, oh, just, you know, I'm going to let her out and see what she does. And, and uh, she, she, had, she did have an encounter with a shot, her first shot bird, which was uh, picked up at miraculous warp speed and brought to my hand. And the dog does not bring a bumper back to my hand. <laughs> so, I mean, there's something about them dogs that are special. Um, but, yeah, the memories don't have to involve, you know, something in the frying pan. You know, they, they really don't. Not at all. Uh, you know, you, you talk about, I said, I'm enamored with the little guys, and, and we've got two of them, as I've mentioned here. But uh, the other day, they, they are always kind of squabbling for uh, lap time. Mm -hmm. And uh, my reading chair, uh, which is uh, nice, it's not a recliner. The way you read, it's got to be well-worn. It is, but <laughs> it's just wide enough that um, one cocker can sit on one side of me mm -hmm. and uh my wife kathleen and i were talking here a few weeks ago and she said something and i said you know what i want for christmas she said what's that i said i, I want a new chair <laughs> she says why do you want a new chair you like your chair i said i need a wider chair so i can get one cocker on the right and one, one cocker on the right. left where my wife says, you don't need a new chair, you just need to lose weight. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I understand. I didn't see that line coming. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I, I did not see it that line like, coming. She was like, nope, <laughs> you don't need a new chair, uh, you just need to lose a little pounds and a little uh, waistline there, and then the dogs will fit. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I like it. Uh, <laughs> that was good. I, I was trying to figure out the punchline ahead of nope, time. Yep. And they're like, well, I know I'm getting a new lazy boy. No. No. You just need to lose some weight. I just need to lose some weight. Plenty so. of room for the dogs. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, my little, my little V, um, the one thing I will say, I was telling you before we hit record, how the personalities are different. I was silly enough to think that, like, cockers came out of a mold, you know. And obviously, like all dogs, they have personalities. But the one thing was identical to what Taffy used to do. In South Dakota, they have a huge pit set that sits about nine people and a big L. And both of those dogs, without ever meeting any of these people, feel that they have the right to go from one lap to the other and then do it all over again, down to the floor, up onto the end of the pit set, and everybody's holding their drinks in their hand and like, hey, hey, Ron, call your dog. I can't. <laughs> and she's just... And the other dog did the same thing. I'm like, well, that must be a cocker thing. Uh, but it's also the size dog that can yeah. get away with it, you know. So. Um, I know you're not the biologist for Rough Grouse Society. You are the regional development uh, coordinator. But what do we know about RGS and Michigan and the Midwest? What's I, I know there's some good news that some well, active uh, uh, again, projects we, going on. Uh, again, uh, across all of our, our regions, 
Um, we have more conservation on the ground work through our conservation team, our force conservation directors mm -hmm. um, that are out there. Um, and probably the, the best uh, thing to do if you're, you're looking for specifics in your region that uh, where you're listening at today is go to the RGS website, yeah. um, roughgrousesociety.org, uh, and look under uh, those regions where we have uh, updates of, of projects uh, from the northeast to the southern apps uh, through the, the Great Lakes states. Uh, but uh, talking Michigan-wise, um, you know, two years ago, we received uh, some chapters received a, a Michigan Wildlife Habitat grant. Uh, and we had some projects called uh, the Southern Woodcock Project, where we're doing habitat work uh, for woodcock migration in southern Michigan. When, mm -hmm. when you think of uh, Michigan, you know, and we kind of look at that maybe US 10 line that yeah. goes from Ludington across and north in the northern yeah, lower. Cuts, the mitten, the, U cuts the, the mitten off about it, halfway. halfway. Yeah. Um, but because we know that woodcock migrate um, and they need good habitat in both stages of their migration, mm -hmm. north and south. Right. Um, south when they're coming back uh, for brooding. Uh, nesting purposes and yeah, south they'll, they'll when they're stop going short of the snow line a lot right they'll, exactly they'll just kind of keep coming up to when they can get soft ground and mm -hmm. i did not know they were doing that so uh, we finished up those projects um and uh, looking to do some more of that uh, in the western um, aspect uh, we have a uh, stewardship agreement now with uh, the Huron Manistee National Forest we'll be some doing some cutting there um, which historically was not a we didn't have any we did not have those relationships right, with the Forest for. Service, not only here, but uh, in other areas. And I think, uh, you know, our forest conservation directors, John Staggerwald up here, Nick uh, B. Miller, and uh, go through the list, Todd Waldron, mm -hmm. um, everyone's doing a great job yeah. in getting that um, and working in those spaces of forests, as well as state uh, and other uh, landowners uh, across the uh, the United States. So that's been real positive. Uh, the Zone Aspen project is going on, um, again in the Huron Manistee here. Um, so um, we're really, our grassroots efforts, our capacity has increased. Um, and, uh, you know, those deliverables um, are out there uh, for all of us to see. Yeah. You know, when you, you look back at it, uh, you know, for a long time, we only had one staff person in the state, uh, Michigan. Now we have four. Uh, we're growing capacity in other regions, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Northeast. Um, so, you know, with that, um, we're giving back uh, in sh demonstrating what we can do with the investments right. that our donors or patrons give us, uh, especially this time of the year as we come into uh, – um, you know, just past Giving Tuesday, but coming in towards a, a very philanthropic time um, in the end of the year. You know, this is something, and I, I say this probably two or three times a year, and I'll, I'll point something out to you on the label of my lat latest covers magazine. Do you see the name that's on that to the person that was mailed to? Now i got to lift my glasses here. To Susan. Right. So last year, and I encourage people to do this with, Whatever organ I, I do it with both of my three of my favorite organizations. At my age, what are my kids going to get me? Right? I've got gun cases, I've got socks, I've got underwear, and it's always like, what can we get you? So a year ago, I said, get yourself a subscription to RGS Magazine. So on my birthday, I got the proof of three my three daughters joining RGS to get the magazine. And is it going to put them in the field? No. But I'm like, why not? Now when I go to their house, I got something to read. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and now two of them, you know, two of them do a little bit of hunting, but I wouldn't call any of them a grouse hunter. And that's why I've told people last year, that's another way of giving, right? I mean, it certainly it's, is. it's the baseline. We need the members. They need the money. And I, I just feel it's like that at least, I know they're going to read a little bit or the, and two of their husbands will hunt a little bit. 
and the articles are good, the information's good, and I don't know, it's just, I thought it was a better way than getting a pair of socks, so now every year, they have to get me, they have to show me that, that they, they, get, they subscribed they or subscribe. became a... I didn't want a, my name, I don't need four coming here with my name, No, I need but, it in their houses when I go visit and babysit. So. so I encourage everybody, you know, like, if you don't know what you want for Christmas, and you've got kids that are old enough to, you know, I know if it's nine years old, it's just, it's a foe, but when you got that child that's old enough and working and says, what do you want for Christmas, mom or dad? I want you to buy yourself a subscription to RGS. Covers. So there. There's my, there's my spiel. Well, it's a great way to look at it. Thank I, you. Yeah. And I got a few people that wrote me and said they did the same thing. So yeah. can't be a bad thing. And Brittany Booth, our editor, I think is doing a wonderful job with the magazine. Uh, not just because they let me scribe some articles in there, but I think, uh, you know, it's uh, it's really tells our story and you know it's got biological information in there yeah. know your plants and, mm -hmm. and that as well as is uh highlighting some of our impactful uh habitat work that we're doing across yeah. the, the it, u.s it's really come around in a couple of years the covers has just it's really changed and i you know i find it it's it's one of the magazines i look forward to really reading cover to cover because it's like it says it's not just another hunting story mm -hmm. we all have hunting stories that's what we're talking about earlier is hunting stories yeah, exactly um so everything's sounds like everything's kind of uh foot to the floor foot gas on the mm. foot on the gas pedal right yeah moving ahead um looking at uh you know projects um for 2023 and beyond uh you know trying to leverage dollars as matched to grants for larger, uh, more impactful uh, projects, projects yeah. for young forest management and diverse forest management. Uh, you know, understanding that uh, it's not always just, you know, one dimensional aspects that we want yeah. um, because both grouse and woodcock need a broad variety of, of habitat right. throughout the, the year, whether it's nesting cover uh, or raising their broods. So, yeah. um, you know, really looking for that on a, a large impact scale with young forest diversity. And, and really, you know, we're the ones out there who are, are touting um, that, you know, we're taking a commodity product and turning it into dollars, helping rural economies, uh, helping uh, put habitat back in the ground, and, yeah. and we, uh, you know, we need support, so. Well, uh, yeah, that's and well, moving forward. That's why we're here, we're going to be begging for a little bit yeah. more stuff here. Um, yeah, so I, I will tell you, my, my grouse season was pretty much condensed to a trip up to the UP and a couple hunts. I, and I'm, I'm so terrible at my I always got this wanderlust so come April May and people start inviting me places yep I'll go yep I'll go and I literally don't put a dent in the grouse and woodcock population in Michigan I I take as Ben Williams said uh for the occasional edification of the dog and the table you know that's about all it's about all I take but there it's it's a it's a bird that when you hunt there's nothing comparable to it like, you could go out to the Dakotas and hunt four different species of birds out, and you could, in some spots, find them on these big open walks with all the view in the world and what I would say is, if they're pointed, layup shots, right? And we choose to shoot at a bird inside of a stem density of about 400 trees per, per what, per 200 feet or something? And so I got to tell the story, and I, I did tell, I'll tell a truncated version. We had a, we had a giveaway um, through uh, Pike Gear, who's a big RGS donor, and, and yeah, Brent's just became a, a corporate sponsor. Corporate Thanks sponsor. Uh, for yep. Brent for that, and yep. you're going to be seeing some really unique uh, things with not only Pike but all of our corporate sponsors: Perina, Benelli, yeah. uh, Sport Dog, and the list uh, moving forward. So, want to shout out, thank you to all of those people uh, who help us and uh, ask. Uh, uh, our listeners or your yeah. listeners to to support those people too. Yeah, it's, Brett's it's a got a, a great product, right? And, and it's American made. Yeah, that's right. It's put together here. It's 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 here. Yeah. Um, so he put together a grouse hunt where I would 
do a hunt with uh, a couple listeners or a couple of participants, and it, there was like 1,100 people that got it, and this young fella and his girlfriend came. It was going to be him and his mom, and his girlfriend uh, took the place of his mom. And we told the guy, and I'll bet you've, I'm going to say that you haven't heard this story. A couple of my, uh, my listeners have from two months ago. But this young man had never shot a feathered creature in its life. Now, he's sporting clay's nut. He's only 21 years old, 22 years old. And we literally told him what he needed to do. Like, he needs to have his hand on the forearm and the grip. you got to be ready. This is, this, is, this is not call and pull. He got two grouse and three woodcock on his first day. Now, <laughs> I don't know anybody who never shot a bird in their life that did that. With rough, and I'm not talking about any layup shots. He took pokes when they flew. He, I told him, I said, do not look at the trees. So it was almost easier to teach somebody instead of just taking somebody out hunting. And they're like, Jesus, this is hard to do. We told him how hard it was going to be. And he literally listened to us. And he was shooting through 100 trees, and there'd be a dead bird. I, we were shocked. You know, woodcock are one thing, but knocking some grouse down without any experience. And he ended up, I think he followed up with two the next day. Unbelievable. I told him, I said, you're done. You hit your pinnacle. You might as well <laughs> go back to Florida and chase quail because you will never do this good again in the grouse woods. But uh, no, and I wanted to ask you something too about, uh, and I should know this, but I don't, the gems that we have, the gem properties in Michigan. Um, was RGS integral to that when they were formed? Well, the, the we GEMS properties we have supported uh, through some projects and grant work over, but mm -hmm. that was really the uh, state, the state, the state concept of right. taking those lands and managing them as grouse enhanced management areas right. uh, called GEMS. Um, I think it's been a, a good program. Yeah, um, It's like anything else. Uh, I think uh, people may not like the the broadcasting of, right. of those public areas mm -hmm. um but it does uh, for i think where it really fits into um it's with older hunters uh and i would say newer too so and they newer learn. hunters so I've, I've steered them toward gems so they know what it should look like exactly you know uh from that you know with the trail systems and that uh you know um we're all getting older and, and walking through, like you said, thick stem density aspen um, certainly uh, is more challenging for me today because, you know, my wife told me I needed to lose weight, um, you know, but uh, than it was 20 years ago. Um, but you find that, uh, you know, gentlemen uh, or ladies, uh, elderly hunters that, that want to Take the walk. Uh, take the walk. Mm -hmm. And even if it's only for an hour, hour and a half, they're able to utilize those. Yeah. And then from a, a educational standpoint, like you mentioned, uh, more novice hunters um, or someone who, like you said, the, the gentleman from Florida, yeah. who's, who's never experienced what is good woodcock cover right. or good grouse cover or this versus this, um, it gives them an opportunity to, to see firsthand right. Um, where they should be spending their time. Yeah, um, exactly. Because if you just told them to go in the woods, it's a little vague. Yes. <laughs> but that's what every grouse hunter says. Where'd you get your birds? In the woods. <laughs> in the woods. So, um, so it, this is just a sideline story. There's a, a big gem, and I don't know remember the name of it. It's up in Gwyn. Or south, I think it's south and a little east of Gwyn. Um, so this isn't hot spot because all the gems are clearly marked on, you know, mapping systems. And we... We had taken this two track out on some state land and purposely stayed away from the gems because, you know, the guide we were with, he, he didn't want us to have to run into other hunters. You know, he wanted to show these people a really, and they showed him a tough, showed me a tough hunt. I mean, we, we had a couple walks where it was literally not fun, you know, uh, where a, you know, a mile walk in over dead blows to get to where the birds were. But guess what? You know, the birds were there. But anyway, we, we had taken this god-awful two-track that his truck went down with no problem, but my full-size Dodge was, we pulled the mirrors in and we're scratching it up, and we finally get out to this bigger, nice, grassy road. And I'm like, I, as soon as we get there, I said, wait, wait, wasn't there a better way to come in here? He goes, no, this is the only way in. It's private on both sides. I'm like, oh, I got to go back out that road again. 
Well, anyway, as we wrapped up this hunt, which was a very nice hunt, a long, long walk in, um, on our way back out, a truck had come out from one of the private sides, just say from the east, and stopped like all grouse hunters like to talk to other grouse hunters. And, of course, he was a uh, what we'd call a UP grouse hunter. He was just going to take a little road hunt. Right? He was just going to drive down the road and look for a few birds. He'd let his dog out if he saw one. But uh, anyway... <clears throat> He said he'd be nice enough to, he had the key to the neighbor's gate so we could drive out on the, on the good track. And before we left, he, and he, I don't think he knew that we were with a guide. He just knew there was a, two trucks and four people. And he says, you guys ought to check out that gems. He said, it's full of birds. And, of course, the guide says, he goes, ah, wait, wait. It, it, I, I go there in the springtime to run my dogs and do a little, you know, preseason training, you know, no gun. He says, I, he says, and he looks at his wife, he goes, I don't know, we go and we'll get, we get like three or four a day every time we go there. We go there midweek. Nobody's hunting it. <laughs> so I'm thinking, maybe down in the lower peninsula, it might be a thing where it is kind of crowded, but, and I don't want to hotspot it, but this guy, he says, I think you're nuts not to be hunting the gems. <laughs> so, and it could be that thing like, if I told you to go up there, you probably weren't going to go to the gems, right? Because you'd think there probably would be, the birds would have been rousted up more. Or, well, uh, or, or would you seek them out? I, I've certainly hunted some gems in the UP, uh, as in the, the northern lower. Yeah. Uh, again, it comes back to to habitat and where you're going. Right. Um, and, you know, are you on a, your way to another area or are you just deadheading one spot right uh, but certainly um again they in my estimation or views um they it's, have it's about as good as the habitat they have be, right good plans they have that diverse young forest um yeah. that the birds excel in mm -hmm. um and you have some and most of them are you know large uh so yeah Plenty if you're room. if Plenty you're room. if you're only hunting the first quarter of a mile from a parking area uh, it's like fishing a trout stream you know right. Um, right. you might have to go a little you further might have to go a little further <laughs> yeah. but uh anyway yeah no i, I was i kind of took that away and i i got another spot i'm going to go to next year i'm like you know what i'm just gonna i'm that's gonna be my target because i got this feeling that a lot of people who are let's say dyed in the wool grouse hunters they have their covers that they know they like and i think they're staying away from them because they think john and joe amateur are going to be there and I'm thinking, I'm just going to find a deep section of those. Because you, you're not going to find, you're going to find great habitat in a lot of spots in the UP. But it's not going to be better than the GEMS. I mean, GEMS has everything, right? I mean, they, it is technically made for what it's called. It, that it, is true. It's enhanced, and it's enhanced. <laughs> and so as I observed the next day and a half, every time we went by this GEMS, the four spots I saw you could have pulled in, I never saw a truck there either. So... And this, this local couple goes, yeah, we go there every day. We get three or four birds. <laughs> well, they're getting all the low-hanging fruit. That's, that's right. All, that's all they're getting. Um, so let's chat a little bit about uh, the, what are we going to call this? Uh, the, 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 the whiskey, uh, we need to give it another name. What are we calling it? The, uh, the whistle pig. What are we going to call this? Well, I think it's uh, the small batch run. Of whistle pig rye for RGS and AWS. AWS patrons and patrons of, of yours. Uh, it's a, a wonderful project that you brought to us. Um, and I'll let you uh, talk a little bit more about it. Uh, yeah, so I got contacted by a listener of my podcast who has a show called Weekly Whiskey, or Whis I always screw it up, Whiskey Weekly. Or weekly whiskey, but apparently, if you like whiskey, it doesn't matter. It's weekly whiskey. And uh, he came on knowing I'm a beer drinker, and he wanted me to come on his, uh, his weekly show. He sent me some samples of some bourbon, and of course, they were looking for the comedic relief of me making faces, going like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and then I'm washing it down with a Miller Lite. And his, his viewers had so much fun. He says, Ryan, you got to come on again. And that second time, I brought on my son-in-law, who has a palate for brown water. And then that turned into um, John reaching out to you and RGS and myself to do yet another sampling of, of 
single batch. What is it? Single barrel? Single, single barrel. Single or barrel. Small batch, single small barrel. Batch, single barrel. And then we had a Zoom room, so to speak, where you and I and who else? Uh, Tripway. Tripway and, uh, and John Henderson hosted it. And we all had our little samples. And the idea was that they would make a single batch, <clears throat> basically whiskey of our choice, whatever we felt was the most palatable, which we took yours and Tripp's advice because no one's going to – I think it all tastes like lighter fluid. But, um, <clears throat> unless I've had about a dozen beers and then somehow it somehow tastes better. Um, but anyway, so we had this together. The, the barrel is done. Um, I believe it's bottled right now, isn't it? I believe it's bottled. Uh, May not be labeled the, yet. Maybe not labeled getting, yet. Uh, but moving forward with that. Yeah. And uh, it will be available through a website link and shipped from a retailer yep. that uh, is legal to ship in across the country. Uh, so there's no uh, uh, liability that aspect. Right, right. And uh, a portion of it will be donated back to RGS right. and AWS. <clears throat> and apparently there's a lot of bourbon and whiskey drinkers in the Rough Grouse Society. That's well, what I, we, we, every we time I hunt with you guys, you guys are always sipping brown water at the end of the day, and I'm sipping beer. So I don't know what it is about grouse, fly fishing, and bourbon and whiskey. I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. So we don't have a link yet, but you'll probably hear it at the end of this or in my intro. Uh, we, we, we didn't jump the gun, but I wanted to get Glenn in here and, and talk about it. And so Whistle Pig, now you're... I don't want to say you're an aficionado. You're, oh, I'm you're, not an aficionado at all. You're the upland tall. librarian, but you're not the yeah, no, you're I'm, not the whiskey librarian. No, I am not. But you like. Uh, I enjoy. <laughs> I certainly do. I saw you smiling while you were drinking it on the. Uh, well, you enjoyed it was, it. You know, maybe it was because it was free. I don't know. Nah, it, 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 you know, it's like anything else. It was an experience. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think when you you look back at all of these things. Um, now I'm going off on a tangent, but you know I'm a storyteller and do these things. That's what we do. That's why I had you come over. <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of, you know, I'd never experienced anything like that before to have, you know, four different batches, uh, batches there and be a part of that. So it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, and in trying to have the distinct... And, and there certainly were some distinct uh, flavors uh, uh, going across the board. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, I, in, as much as I'm not a, <clears throat> a brown water drinker, I was, listen, I was listening to you guys describe what you're drinking, and all I tasted was like, I don't know what they're talking about, but that's different than that one, and that's different than that one. And so turns out the one that I could get down past my tongue was the one we did not choose. <laughs> It's probably, probably it was probably from the bottom of the barrel, but uh, uh, but no, it, you know, and it it was a unique thing, and it's a unique way to to you know explore some different options and understand bringing it back full circle to habitat, mm -hmm. bringing it back full circle to habitat. Uh, in forestry, in diverse forest management, and the importance of this not only for wildlife but for rural economies and for everything. What do we age whiskey in? Oak barrels. Oak barrels. So in order for anybody to do this, we have to have viable forestry management programs. Right. And we have to be able to harvest sustainably – Mm -hmm. oak to turn that into a cask that whether it's bourbon or rye or sherry or port or right. wine, um, yeah, a it's, strong Cabernet it's with legs. It's tied more into conservation than it, it is being a beer know, drinker. So, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we it, just cut down hops. <laughs> but, it, well, no, but again, uh, not going off on all this, uh, in a, what does... Beer need good clean water. Sure. Again, what does where does good clean water come from? Understanding uh, the aquifer system and understanding our environments and our habitat, and 
those sorts of things. It, it, it all of these things are intertwined uh, in some <clears throat> fashion, and uh, I'm just fortunate to to be able to to talk to people in this kind of my right. second career about the importance of conservation, their legacy to diverse forest management. Uh, if you're a grouse and woodcock hunter, and and all the other neotropical songbirds that come with it. Uh, white-tailed deer, turkeys, whatever, turkeys. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's all entwined. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, when this link gets out, uh, some of our patrons that uh, will be interested and uh, I not, think that our, I not, not think that our, our taste buds were, uh, oh, I'm gonna were blame, out of line. If somebody doesn't like it, they cannot blame me. <laughs> they cannot blame me. But I don't think with Whistlepig being a very well-established distillery... No that anybody's going to mind um, having a bottle of this, and it'll have an RGS label on it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's worthy of the shelf on your, on your back bar in that's your basement or your garage, wherever you keep it. Um, I wouldn't put it under the sink because that's not showing it proudly. Bob, these bottles should be on display. But people will know that when they buy that, uh, you know, whether it's a gift for their, somebody they know that likes whiskey or if it's a gift for themselves, which... Believe me, if I was a whiskey drinker, I'd be, you know, they'd have to lay off third shift if I quit, you know. <laughs> um, so it'll be available to listeners of the show and RGS patrons. I'm sure RGS will do an email out to their membership to where there's another way of supporting conservation because a, a good portion of the proceeds of this single barrel uh, yet to, I don't know, like I said, we have a name for it, but there's not the name on there. I mean, like, I, I think of, like, Wild Turkey, Old Crow. You know, it needs a name, but I don't know what the name's going to be. But it's going to be, this is a one-off. And for people who get, get that, you know, it's like people with coffee that like different coffees, right? And then there's people that just drink coffee from the gas station. Um, for people who really like bourbons and whiskeys, when you say single batch, small batch, single barrel, there's not another one like that. No. I mean, it'll be a one of a kind. It'll be a one of a kind taste, one of a kind flavor, and for those who have the palate for it, they will know that. Um, so I, I wish I could learn to, you know, enjoy it, um, but you know, maybe maybe that's not a good thing. I, I have a a problem with addictions as it is, so I don't need another. I don't need another one, but uh, I, I'm excited, and I, and I think hopefully we're going to have that out here in the next week or so. Um, put it this way. You're going to be listening to this because we already have the links to it. So <laughs> I forgot. We're, we're pre-recording this. But I wanted to get it done so when this thing's ready to sell, we can, maybe uh, we can get some out there before Christmas and certainly before New Year's. Exactly. Um, who, who took care of the artwork for that? Um, Ashley Peters, our uh, director of communications, uh, was involved with, with that. Um, so I can't wait to see it. I haven't even seen a picture of it. Have you seen a picture of it? I have not. Uh, so. oh, damn. Now we just got to go back and talk about dogs again. Well, could be worse things. To I do was going to say worse things to do on a Wednesday. Um, did you do any traveling besides with RGS? Did you get any hunting trips in? No, I, I, I really didn't. Um, well, I, I take it back. <laughs> I say I well, really you went did, to the national I, hunt. Yeah, I, I was just in Missouri uh, for a couple days um, with uh, talking to a, a donor down there and. Uh, did a little walking and quail hunting. Did you see so, a few? Yeah, we saw a few. Nice. Um, it was kind of fun. I mean, they're so, fighting the same thing everybody's fighting, right? Yeah, Habitat. I, you yeah. know, it's uh, it, it all comes back to that to that mix. Yeah. Um, so I, I did do that, uh, and uh, thinking about going to a, a, a dog training seminar in Georgia uh, coming up after the first of the year. So, uh, yeah, I've got a little traveling in, but, mm -hmm. uh, again, going back, uh, with my mother's situation, I was, was kind of reticent to, to travel, uh, to really plan a bunch of things. Yeah, well, and then, those things happen. Then, yeah. um, so onward to upward for next year. Right. So. The next year can always be better. Yeah, this, exactly. this was, this year I had the last year, I should go back for 2021 season, a friend of mine said, you know, with your judging assignments and your trips you got coming, why don't you put it on a Word doc and give it to your wife? And it worked out really good because I gave it to her in July, right? In June and July. 
and I updated it. And she's like, okay, you're going here, you're going to be going there, you're going to be going. I did the same thing this year, except I just stretched out the hunts. And she didn't really read it. She just says, oh, okay, you're going to be gone here. And before I left on my first trip, she goes, why are you going to be gone two weeks? <laughs> I said, well, I gave, I gave you the heads up. I just, you don't normally get, I said, well, I was never retired before. So I've had uh, a couple of, and this has not happened to me in all my hunting years. I've had a couple of two-week trips being gone for two weeks, playing with the dogs, swinging on some birds, seeing friends, hunting with, hunting with friends I made just through the podcast that say, hey, if you're ever coming through, um, you know, we don't have a lot of birds here, but I'd love to, love to meet you. And it, it was just probably my best hunting year, no, not grouse and woodcock, but just for me traveling, the highlight for me was North Dakota. I was going to go on to Wyoming, and I had a young dog, um, which is Tagus, my, my wire-haired Vigila. And the prairie birds and the Huns were in good numbers this year. And we literally were living in a house that was dead set in the middle of great territory. And I couldn't bring myself to drive another day to Wyoming, losing another day to come back, when I could get my dog into birds every day at my leisure. So my friends all left kind of on schedule, and I, was, I had the whole, I had five days to myself. Five days. I've never had that in my life. Like, get up in the morning, go, I don't bacon, sausage, egg. Yeah, you know what? I'll take the dog out real quick. Then I'll come back and make breakfast. And then I'll take a little nap. And then I go back out again in the afternoon. Or then I drive around scout. I'm telling you, I was spoiled this year. The opposite. Um, so I don't know. You never know what the next year is going to bring. But if you don't dream big, as Ruth says, you'll have nightmares. So dream big. You know, trips like that are special. Yeah. Uh, trips like that are, are very, very special, and uh, uh, certainly this year wasn't, but uh, uh, I've had a couple of those single solitary time frames, um, both with dogs and with angling, and, uh, you know, they're really, really nice. Right. Um, they're refreshing. Uh yeah, there's something about being by yourself and making all your own decisions. Because I'm sure you've been, you've hunted with a lot of, you, I would venture to say you hunt with people more often than you hunt by yourself. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, most people do. You know, most people Even do. I mean, we buddy. have, we have, you know, I have some good friends um, that we share time together. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know. You know, we carve out three, four days there, or two or three days here, yeah. or whatever. Uh, but you know, it's it's nice to be able just to sometimes take a stroll just with you and your hound. Yep, uh, and just decide because I don't care how. And I I hunt with a, I hunt with one of my friends. I've known him since I was five. We've hunted together since we were in high school. And him and I, after five days, could drive each other crazy because we're that good at arguing with each other. Luckily, he's not a dog guy per se, so he doesn't try to oversteer me. But even though I've and I've hunted with some other friends that we see each other every year, and inevitably, it may be where we're going to eat dinner or where we're going to hunt first. But there's always like some extra, not drama, but there's just some planning involved, right? And and I've had a couple where somebody brought somebody with on a hunt, and like. One trip to South Dakota, a friend brought a, a friend from Ohio. Super nice guy. Didn't know anything about pheasant hunting. He's from Ohio, you know, and this is, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I don't think there's a wild pheasant in Ohio, is there? I doubt Probably it. not too and, many. And within a day, he was a pheasant expert. <laughs> now, I could have used that five day just to calm down <laughs> after spending three days with him professing to know everything there was about pheasants based on his first encounter with a pheasant. So, yeah, those times you get to be by yourself and make your own decisions, I tell you that I don't, and I may not get that again the rest of my life. Who knows? But I'll tell you what, this year was twice, and it was just blissful, just <laughs> blissful. Oh, The one thing I will say about that in, in spending time, I, I, I'm a big proponent of trying to spend time by yourself, uh, you know, I guess I'm kind of 
you know, kind of a solitary, quiet person, though most people would, would say that's not true. Well, because they meet um, you in a different... Different light. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to do that, have your wits about you um, because stupid, bad things happen in the out of doors. Mm -hmm. um, and as you're sitting here talking about this, uh, this is a really stupid story myself. Um, my family's originally from, or my grandparents were originally from central Pennsylvania, Center County, outside of State College. And we had a home there for many years. And my great grandfather was in the timber business out there. And uh, we fished all these little small backcountry runs. And, uh, and I knew him well. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, on one of these trips I was telling you about, I was out, out there all by myself. And this is back before cell phones. And our place didn't have a phone, no communication. It was just a glorious time. Um, I'm talking to this old timer, this guy who's like a little older than my grandfather. My grandfather had passed away and talking about fishing this little wild trout stream, this run. And he said, well, you know how to get into the uh, upper reaches of this run. I'm going to be remain nameless. Vague about it, but that's Vague about fine. it. And yeah. I said, well, yeah, I've always heard there's a way to get in. He goes, oh, it's really easy. You know, you just go up X2 track till you come to the culvert that's going underneath the road. And you walk down that culvert till you get to the top of the ridge. And when you get to the top of the ridge, you're going to turn left and you go down that ridge, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred yards, and you're going to see a big pile of rocks. And when you get to that big pile of rocks, you drop down over the ridge and you're going to come to like this big three oak trees grown out of one stump. And when you get to the three oak trees, you go a little bit to your left and you come to the creek. I go, this is great. So I get up the next Sounds morning. Sounds like a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> and I get up the next morning and uh, grab a couple beers that I'm going to stash in the cricket the, for the end of the day and take a little tin of oysters and sardines and favorite snacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not, and uh, fortunately I had my compass and I'm in a pair of like hip boots and anyway, it doesn't matter. And that's what I do. Park at the culvert, walk down the culvert, get to the ridge line, go find the stones, drop down, find the tree, kick to the creek. And I have a pretty good day fishing. And it's like, I don't know if anybody had been in there fishing ants or beetles. It was in the summertime. And it's all wild brook trout in there. Nothing huge. One fish, I don't know, might have went nine, ten inches. But just it's what you gorgeous love. day. Yeah. Okay. And I'm walking back up, get to where I'm going to get out, have a beer, walking up the thing, and I step in a ground hornet's nest. And I got ground hornets going down my hip boots, up my shorts, in me, and I'm running oh. blindly through the woods. Okay? Oh. I run blindly through the woods and then break out in the – and this is back when I was young. I mean, uh, anyway, I know people you, now thinking you, me running you, blindly through the woods have a, a, a irresistibly laughing going on right, like right. there's no way. But anyway, um, you, my, get, you, got, you made some distance between the original and count. And now I've got, I'm hot and sweaty and stung. nauseous and stung multiple times and all that stuff's going through. So I sit down and actually kind of doze out um, and then kind of come to 15, 20 minutes later and realize that nobody has any clue where I am, nor do I have a clue where I am because I had this wonderful path. You know, you start at the culvert, right. and I was just going to read, and I can't tell you if I ran north, south, east, or west. Just I just ran. So, you know, you pull out your compass, and you start, and you're going, ah, uh, you know, can't and it's be, always that way. <laughs> it's always good to have an out. And in this case, um, I had an out to the east, a hard pack road to the east, and I had uh, this two track to the south. So I knew uh, if I kind of go southeast, I'm eventually going to come something. But you know, you're always judging 
second guessing. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Anyway, long story short, I made it back uh, to the two track, and I looked to my right and couldn't see my truck, and I looked to my left, and I came out probably 300 yards away from it. Oh. <laughs> Which, uh, you know. So if you're going to enjoy some of those uh, those personal times, just let somebody know where you are. Because I, I, I made a point of not telling my wife I was hunting by myself for those five days. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what she would have thought. She's, what are you going to do when you fall in a badger hole? So, uh, I don't you know. know what I'm going to do when I fall in a badger hole. It's like across that bridge when I come to it. Stupid things happen. It is. Uh, or silly things happen, I should say. So but be, now, be careful out now there. Now at least you can have the SOS, you know. Yeah. On, on a Garmin, that's that's. I told my wife I got the little mini inReach, and it's in my backpack. It. I don't even know if I charged it last time, but it'll hold a charge if it's not on. I wouldn't want to have to use the SOS button, but back when you did that, there was no there, SOS. There was no, no. And no. for all you know, you could have had a bad allergic reaction to that. Oh. You could have been there. You could have died. I mean, seriously, could have died. So yeah. So lesson be learned. Enjoy the solitude. Pay but attention. Be. Be careful. Watch where you're walking. <laughs> all right. Anything else we got to cover? No, I just want to thank you and all your listeners uh, for their continued support uh, of the Rough Grouse and American Woodcock Societies. Uh, if you uh, go to our website, roughgrousesociety.org, uh, to see projects that are going on in your region or upcoming events. Uh, we're planning a, a strong uh, event season for 2023. That's nice. Uh, that's going forward. Uh, we have events uh, in all regions, and uh, we're in the planning process for that. So, uh, you know, habitat days, hunts, banquets, target shoots. Uh, we've got the New York City banquet coming up if anybody's uh, in York, the city. I, I have to say it like a commercial. New York City. New York City. Rough Grouse uh, Society We're having a, an event there. Uh, so, uh, you know, some really good events all across the region uh, coming up. Our engagement coordinators are, are really doing a great job. Our chapters, our volunteerism is the core uh, to all of this. Uh, within, uh, without those strong support uh, on that grassroots level, um, you know, we wouldn't be talking. We today. wouldn't be talking. So, right. uh, thanks to all. Thank you for listening. And Ron, on behalf of RGS and AWS, thanks for having me. Well, that's my pleasure. So, and a single reminder: you'll be getting a, uh, you'll you you will have gotten. Is that boy? I not only do not read a lot. I'm not. I'm not good at speaking like that. You will have received by the time you uh, listen to this. That's always the thing to do. <laughs> if you're not sure, change the word. Change the word. Don't yes. try to make that word work into a nope. sentence. You should have received, in coordination with the release of this podcast, a link through my website, through RGS's website, through several other venues, the ability to help out with conservation and get yourself the gift of some whistle pig, single barrel. Or... A membership to RGS AWS. Yeah, and that's what I told you in the beginning. If you don't know what you want for Christmas, have somebody buy it for you. doesn't even matter if they're a grouse hunter. We need members. We need members. Yeah, with every membership drive, you might get one or two more that are going to be taking your job someday, and we need that. We're going to need somebody to, you know, we've got to have somebody pulling up behind to the rear, right? Certainly. And that's where they come from. They don't, they don't, they don't get in your position the first year they grouse hunt. Well, <laughs> and I think understanding that, that conservation, and I know you're trying to end this up, but conservation is such a mentored uh, trait or, you know, there's a lot of clay target shooters out there, but they may not necessarily transfer into the woods. Right. And as we go forward in looking towards conservation in this country, um, we really need to have an upswell of, of membership yeah. and mentors so people understand it at a youthful, younger age, not when they're old, fat, and right. white-haired like me. You know, where did I learn about it? 
where did I get impassioned in this? Right. It's through my father and grandfather, right. you know, when I was a lad. Um, and to go through there. So that, that mentorship process, that member process is so, so important. And that's where coming up with a, a pint night or a, or a banquet, that's, that could be your conduit into it. Exactly. It doesn't have to be from your grandpa or your uncle or no. your dad or your mom. Nope. It could come from just some goofy guy on a microphone with another goofy guy on the other side of the table. <laughs> All right, Glenn, I appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you a few more stories when we leave, and uh, that's it. Let's wrap it up. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good day. I love you guys. I love you girls, and I love you RGS members more. <laughs>